Welcome back, and uh, we're getting back to the word studies. So, word study, repent slash repentance, and we are in the book of Jeremiah. So, if you want to turn to Jeremiah 4, uh, I'm going to start in verse 20 to get in context. So, Jeremiah verse, chapter 4, verse 20, if I can say it right. So, destruction upon destruction is cried, for the whole land is spoiled. Suddenly are my tents spoiled, and my curtains in a moment. How long shall I see the standard and hear the sound of the trumpet? For my people is foolish, they have not known me. Talking about the Jewish people. They are sottish children, and they have none understanding. They are wise to do evil, but to do good they have no knowledge. Sounds like a lot of people today. I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void, and the heavens, and they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens were fled. See how far we're going all the way. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord and by His fierce anger. This is important. Uh, it's broken down by the presence of the Lord and His fierce anger. For thus hath the Lord said, The whole land shall be desolate, yet will I not make a full end. For this shall the earth mourn, and the heavens above be black, because I have spoken it, I have purposed it, and will not repent, neither will I turn back from it. The whole city shall flee for the noise of the horsemen and bowmen, horsemen and bowmen. They shall go into thickets and climb up upon the rocks. Every city shall be forsaken, and not a man dwell therein. And when, they, and when thou art spoiled, what wilt thou do? Though thou closest thyself with crimson, though thou deckest thee with ornaments of gold, though thou rentest thy face with paintings, in vain shalt thou make thyself fair. Thy lovers will despise thee, they will seek thy life. For I have heard a voice as of a woman in travail, and the anguish as of her that bringeth forth the first child, her first child, the voice of the daughters of Zion that bewaileth her, that spreadeth her hand, saying, Woe is to me, for my soul is weary because of murderers. Now verse 28 is where we see the word repent. And the reason I went so far, it's a, it's a prophecy of what's going to happen to the Jewish people in the time of Jacob's trouble. I hope I'm not getting that wrong. But with this context, remember, this is all about the context of the word repent. Sometimes we can get into it a little bit. Sometimes it's just about getting repent because doing a huge study would take a long time. So repent in context here is definition number four. Apply to a supreme being to change the course of providential dealings. Why? Because it talks about it right here in verse 28. For this shall the earth mourn and the heavens above be black because I have spoken it. God's saying this is what's going to happen. I have purposed it. There's a purpose for it, the time of Jacob's trouble. And will not repent. He's not going to change. This is set up. It's going to happen. I'm not changing the providential dealings. If you've been following along with these word studies, you'll realize there's times where God says, I'm going to do this. He does it part way and then says, I'm going to repent. In other words, he's showing mercy and he's going to stop the punishment. So there's times where God will change providence, how he's going to do something. He said he's going to do this, he stops. Uh, we haven't got to the book of Jonah, but the people repent. He's going to destroy the city, but the people repent. And this isn't, I might destroy the city, I'm going to destroy the city. But the people repent, and he's like, okay, I won't. I'm going to repent. I'm not going to destroy the city. So, um, Jeremiah 4. Repent there is not... A physical act as far as the act of a physical act it's not a work okay the whole point of these studies is to sh see if repent or repentance is ever a work in itself we've learned that something happens before repentance 
Something can happen after repentance, true biblical salvation, but the repentance itself is not works. It's something that happens in the heart. God looks and says, okay, I've planned this. It's already going to happen. Even though this is in the past, it's prophesying the future. It's going to happen, and I will not repent. I will not change my mind and say, okay, I'm going to forgive you, and that's not going to happen. All right. Next mention is Jeremiah chapter 8. A couple chapters over. Jeremiah chapter 8, 1 through 9. We're going to go through 1 through 9, starting at verse 1. At that time, saith the Lord, they shall bring out the bones of the kings of Judah, and the bones of his princes, and the bones of the priests, and the bones of the prophets, and the bones of the inhabitants of Jerusalem out of their graves. And they shall spread them before the sun and the moon and all the host of heaven whom they have loved and whom they have served and after whom they have and after whom they have walked and whom they have sought and whom they have worshipped. They shall not be gathered nor be buried, they shall be for dung upon the face of the earth, and death shall be chosen rather than life by all the residue of them that remain of the evil family, which remain in all the places whither I have driven them, saith the Lord of hosts. Moreover, thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, Shall they fall and not rise? arise? Shall he turn away and not return? Why then is the people of Jerusalem slidden back by a perpetual backsliding? They hold fast deceit, they refuse to return. I hearkened and heard, but they spake not aright. No man repented, here it is, no man repented him of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? Everyone turned to his course as the horse rushes into the battle. Now there's where we have our word repent. And we're going to keep going to get the context. But repent here. In theology, to sorrow be pained for sin as a violation of God's holy law. That's the important part here. Why do we know that that's what repent means here? Let's keep reading. Verse 7, Yea, the stork in the heaven knoweth her appointing, appointed times, and the turtle and the crane and the swallows observe the time of their coming. But my people know not the judgment of the Lord. How do, how do ye say we are wise, and the law of the Lord is with us, it's a question, lo, certainly in vain may he it, the pen of the scribes is in vain. The wise men are ashamed, they are dismayed and taken, lo, they have rejected the word of the Lord, and what wisdom is in them. Okay, they're not repenting, they're not keeping the law, okay, they're falling uh, into strange gods, if you read the whole Old Testament, after the, um, Solomon, the kings, one king would serve, would be true to the Lord, take down the high places, other kings wouldn't, they'd build them back up again, worship false gods, and they'd come back to the Lord. False gods come back to the Lord, they went into Babylon, God freed them from Babylon eventually. And we're going to get to a good verse here about all that repenting that God keeps doing throughout the whole Old Testament. So far from our reading, I'm realizing that it's mentioning that God, and when He repents, remember, God's not a sinner because He says He repents. It's a change in providence. It's grace. It's mercy. He goes from doing this to doing this. And oftentimes, it's mercy. Okay? Finding out that it really shows God's mercy a lot throughout the Old Testament. So, um, talking about the law... The Jewish people won't repent. And what's one of the big things that they're doing that's wrong? They're worshiping false gods. They're letting sodomy in. I mean, they're doing a lot of wicked things that the law says they're not supposed to do. Okay. Next verse, Jeremiah 15. Let's go over to Jeremiah 15. And of course, that verse, another thing to point out is it's talking about how in the New Testament says the laws are a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And that just shows, that's a verse showing, talking about it, how there's no way they could keep the law. Okay. Jeremiah 15, verse 5. We're going to start in verse 5. 
For who shall have pity upon thee, O Jerusalem? Or who shall bemoan thee? Or who shall go aside to ask how thou doest? Thou hast forsaken me, saith the Lord. They went to false gods. Thou art gone backward. Therefore will I stretch out my hand against thee and destroy thee. I am weary with repenting. This is the big verse right here. And I will fan them with a fan in the gates of the land. I will bereave them of children. I will destroy my people since they return not from their ways. Their widows are increased to me above the sand of the seas. I have brought upon them against the mother of the young men a spoiler at noonday. Let's see if I went too far. Yeah, I just meant to stop at verse 7. But notice what it says here in verse 6. I am weary with repenting. If you follow along in this study, brothers and sisters in Christ, God's been doing a lot of repenting throughout the Old Testament. He's been showing a lot of grace and a lot of mercy. I mean, you go through the wicked things that the Jewish people are doing, worshiping false gods, even to the point of sacrificing animals to Baal. I think it was Solomon that got uh, pulled away from the Lord with strange wives and started worshiping Baal, and he was sacrificing kids, babies, to this thing. I mean, it's just wickedness, sodomy getting brought in, uh, marrying outside their kindred, and in doing so, they brought false gods in. And they're just living in wicked sin, and God just pounds them hard. But He doesn't destroy them. He has mercy. And this verse, repentance, repenting, still applies to this verse definition number 4. We're using the Webster's 1820 Dictionary, and we're backing it up. Sometimes in my studies, I might come across the word that I... I believe has a little bit of an alteration in how it's used versus with the Webster's 1828 Dictionary, or there's a definition that's not in the Webster's 1828 Dictionary. So that's not my final authority. My final authority is the King James Bible, which is why we're going through it. But it's still applied to a supreme being to change the course of providential dealings. God's going weary is what it's talking about here. Okay. I am weary with repenting. Jesus comes onto the scene. They reject Jesus Christ. We're in what they call the church age. Then the time of Jacob's trouble comes back, and God's really going to discipline the Jewish people. And then the millennial kingdom. Uh, his repenting, like he does in the Old Testament, he's getting weary and it's slowing down to the point where he's not going to need to repent anymore. Okay. So, repent there. Repenting has to do with the providential dealings that God does, how He deals with people. He's doing, he starts out doing this, He changes midway, He can change beforehand. Okay, I was going to do this, but now I'm not, because you repented. God gave us free will. He loves us. Next, we are going to 18, Jeremiah 18, 7. Jeremiah 18, 7 through 11. So we have two times repent is used, verse 8 and 10. So there's going to be two times to look for. But Jeremiah 18, starting in verse 7. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it? If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. Change in providence, okay? He's going to do evil to them. He's going to punish them. They do good. Does it turn from their evil? I will repent. So it's a providential dealing. So that's the first time. Second time, let's keep going. Verse 9. And at what instance I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it? If it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. I'm supposed to go one more time. One more verse. Now therefore go to, speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I frame evil against you and devise a device against you. Return ye now every one from his evil way and make your ways and your doings good. 
Both time repentance in here has to do with providential dealings, but we'll go into it a little bit. The Old Testament, there was a lot of promises, and there's a lot of things with what we call Bible ifs. If you do this, I'll do this, as the Lord's saying. If you do this, I'll do this. If you do this, I'm going to do that. And that's what this is talking about. If you, if you are being punished of the Lord in the Old Testament, and even today, you, uh, chastisement, you repent and you turn from that evil, God will change from ta chastising you to blessing you. And the same thing goes with you can be blessed by the Lord and everything's going great, but you fall back into sin. God's going to change and repent of that blessing and go back into chastening. That's what's going on here. Both times, it's a reference to the Lord repenting and it's a change of providence, how He's going to deal with you. If you do good, He's going to deal good with you. If you do bad, He's going to deal bad with you. Not, you know, punish you. And if He's punishing you, the repentance part is, if He's punishing you and you start doing good again and you repent, He, he repents and goes from punishing you to doing good. Taking care of you, blessing you. And vice versa. That's all this is talking about. Okay? Once again, God is not a sinner when He repents. And repentance is not a work. God repents. That's something that happens in Him. Then, the action happens. Jeremiah is right here. He's saying he'll do it before the action happens or not happens. Yes, they're in wicked sin, but he's saying you do good. So, Jeremiah 20. Next mention of repent. Begin to think repentance is a New Testament word. I haven't come across that yet. But Jeremiah 20, we're going to read 1 through 18. It'll be a long read, looks like. Um, now Fasher, the son of Emer, the priest, who was also chief governor in the house of the Lord, heard that Jeremiah prophesied these things. Then Fasher smote Jeremiah the prophet and put him in the stocks that were in the high gates of Benjamin, which was by the house of of the Lord. And it came to pass on the morrow that Fasher brought forth Jeremiah out of the stocks. Then said Jeremiah unto him, The Lord hath not called thy name uh, Fasher. I'm just going to use the word Pasher or Fasher. But, gosh, I'm bad with names. Mag Mithabib. For thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will make thee a terror to thyself and to all thy friends. And they shall fall by the sword of their enemies, and thine eyes shall behold it. And I will give all Judah into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall carry them captive into Babylon, and shall slay them with the sword. So we got an evil king, or pasher. Um, oh, he's the priest. I'm sorry, we just read that. And Isaiah, or Isaiah, Jeremiah, I got focus. Jeremiah is prophesying evil against him because of who he is and how he's acting. Moreover, I will deliver all the strength of this city and all the laborers thereof and all the precious things thereof and all the treasures of the kings of Judah will I give into the hand of their enemies, which shall spoil them and take them and carry them to Babylon. And thou, Fasher, and all that dwell in thine house shall go into captivity and thou shalt come to Babylon. And there thou shalt die, and shalt be buried there, thou and all thy friends, to whom thou hast prophesied lies. There is priest. O Lord, thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. Thou art stronger than I, and hast prevailed. I am in de derision daily, every one mocketh me. For since I spake, I cried out, I cried violence and spoil, because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me, and a derision daily. Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name, but his, but his word was in my heart, as a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. For I heard the defaming of many fear on every side, report say they, 
and we will report it, and all my familiars watched for my halting, saying, Peradventure will he be enticed, and we shall prevail against him, and we shall take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me as a mighty, terrible one. Therefore my persecutors shall stumble, and they shall not prevail. They shall be greatly ashamed, for they shall not prosper. Their everlasting confusion shall never be forgotten. The Lord is with me as a mighty, terrible one in that verse. That's just something that really got to sink in. A lot of people like to just preach, God is love, God is love. Uh, what does it say here? But the Lord is with me as a mighty, terrible one to the enemies. Twelve. But, O Lord of hosts, and the whole point of going through this is letting you know the prophecy that's being prophesied by Jeremiah to Fasher. Pasher, Fasher. But, O Lord of hosts, that triest the righteous and seest the reins in the hearts, let me see thy vengeance on them, for unto thee have I opened my cause. That's how they treated Jeremiah for prophesying truth. 13. Sing unto the Lord, praise ye the Lord. For he hath delivered the soul of the poor from the hand of evildoers. Cursed be the day wherein I was born. Let not the day wherein my mother bare me be blessed. Cursed be the man who brought tidings to my father, saying, A man child is born unto thee, making him very glad. And let that man be as the cities which the Lord overthrew, and repented not. And let him hear the cry in the morning and the shouting at noontide. There's where we get our repentance. Okay. Yeah, yeah. 17. Because he slew me not from the womb, or that my mother might have been my grave, and her womb is to be always great with me. Wherefore came I forth out of the womb to see labor and sorrow, that my days should be consumed with shame? Question mark. Uh, Jeremiah is going through a lot. Okay, he's preaching truth. He's he's God saying say this. He's saying it, and it's having consequences. Kind of like preaching the gospel today and standing for absolute truth today. But we're doing context of repentance. He says it shows that he's prophesying something evil on somebody who's evil. Okay, and he's getting put in stocks. He's getting treated bad because of it. But here in verse 16, And let that man be as the cities which the Lord overthrew and repented not. Okay. This goes to number four again, providential dealings. Apply to a supreme being, change the course. He's saying those cities that God didn't repent, he destroyed them. He didn't change his mind saying, okay, I'll spare the city. Um, chances are they didn't repent. I'm almost positive about that. But he's saying those cities like Sodom and Gomorrah, he didn't repent of what he did. He destroyed the city top to bottom. Um, there's a lot of things that God has done that he didn't repent. He didn't change his providence. They didn't repent themselves. They didn't want God's mercy, so he didn't show it. It's that simple. So the context here is he's preaching evil against Fasher. He's getting punished for it, having a, you know stocks and then being dragged before him. And he's being weary. It's almost like he's, he's sorrowful and he's talking that way. So, providential dealings. God changing. He's, the point here is saying that I hope he doesn't change. He doesn't repent of the evil he's going to do. And he's talking about himself. You know, being weary of life and death. I think it was Paul that said that. Um, I could be wrong. Next, verse 26. There's a lot of mentions to repentance in this book. A lot of prophecy. Verse 26, we're going to start at verse 3. And there's two more mentions in these. If so be, they will hearken and turn every man from his evil way, that I may repent me of the evil which I purpose to do unto them because of the evil of their doings. Once again, they're doing bad. He's going to punish them. They start going. They repent of the bad they're doing. He's God's going to repent of the bad he's doing, the evil, uh, the punishment. It's a good way to say it. 
And thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, If we, if ye will not hearken to me to walk in my law, which I have set before you, to hearken to the words of my servants, the prophets, whom I sent unto you, both rising up early and sending them, but ye have not hearkened. Then will I make this house like Shiloh, and will make this city a curse to all the nations of the earth. So the priests and the prophets and all the people heard Jeremiah speaking these words in the house of the Lord. Now it came to pass when Jeremiah had made an end of speaking all that the Lord had commanded him to speak unto all the people, that the priests and the prophets and all the people took him, saying, Thou shalt surely die. Uh, despairing life and death. I can understand. I can't truly fathom what he's going through, Jeremiah, but he's doing what the Lord told him to do without... The, who cares about the consequences? It bothers him. It wears on him. Uh, he gets depressions. When it's, it sounds like the last verse we were talking about. Thou shalt surely die. Verse 9. Why hast thou prophesied in the name of the Lord, saying, This house shall be like Shiloh, and this city shall be desolate without an inhabitant? And all the people were gathered against Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. When the princes of Judah heard these things, then they came up from the king's house unto the house of the Lord and sat down in the entry of the new gate of the Lord's house. Then spake the priests and the prophets unto the princes and to all the people, saying, This man is worthy to die, for he hath prophesied against this city, as ye have heard with your ears. Then spake Jeremiah unto all the princes and to all the people, saying, The Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and against this city all the words that ye have heard. Therefore now amend your ways and your doings and obey the voice of the Lord your God, and the Lord will repent him of the evil that he hath, purposed, or hath pronounced against you. Both times talking about a providential dealing uh, apply to a supreme being to change the promise. It's God saying, if you do this, I'm going to do that. It's guaranteed. But if you do this, I won't do that. He's already saying, I'm going to do this. He's going down a path. Okay, you do evil, I'm going to punish you. It's guaranteed to happen. You start doing evil, God's going to go punish you, but you repent and you turn from the evil. God's like, Okay, I won't do the evil. You repented my grace, my mercy. Providential dealing. There's a lot of that in the Bible. God's grace and God's mercy is shown throughout all the Bible. When God repents, it's not Him being a sinner. Okay, repentance is not a work, and it doesn't mean repent itself does not mean that when God does it that He's a sinner. Words have meaning. Words do not have just one definition every time. And it has to be the same Uniform, uniform translation, no. Unif I'd say uniform definition. We'll say it like that. It doesn't have a uniform definition across the board. Jeremiah 31. Got a couple more and we're finished. Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31, verse 18 through 20. We'll start in 18. I have surely heard Ephraim's bemoaning himself thus, Thou hast chastised me, and I was chastised as a bullock unaccustomed to the yoke, turn thou me, and I shall be turned, for thou art the Lord my God. Surely after that I was turned, I repented. After he turned. Okay? This is what they try to claim repentance is for salvation. You've got to change your life and then you repent. Uh, that repentance is works, but some people say that means you have to clean up your life and then you get saved. No, we've learned in this study that there's people who clean up everything first and then repent. Then there's people who repent and then clean everything up. Repentance is something that happens in the heart. Um, 19, repentance here, I have put two definitions you could argue. To feel pain, sorrow, or regret for something done or spoken. Because he already changed and turned. He was chastised of the Lord. He turned from that wickedness. 
And now he's repenting. He's having sorrow for something he did. For uh, definition of two, to express sorrow for something past. Okay. Surely after that I was turned, I repented. And after that I was instructed. I smote upon my thigh. I was ashamed. Okay, that's why I said regret for something done or spoken. Because I was ashamed, yea, even confounded, because I did bear the reproach of my youth. Is Ephraim my dear son? Is he a pleasant child? For since I spake against him, I do earnestly remember him still. Therefore my bowels are troubled for him. I will surely have mercy upon him, saith the Lord. Okay. Repentance. To feel pain, sorrow, or regret for something done or spoken. Repent in this context. Okay, God chastened him. The change happened before. Then he repented. And we've noticed, not, I know I'm repeating myself sometimes, that it's for me and it's for you. We know that actions can happen before repentance. And we know that actions can happen after repentance. But that repentance itself happens here. Okay. Last time Jeremiah... Chapter 42, last time repent is mentioned. Chapter 42. Okay. Starting at verse 5, going to go from 5 through to 12. Then they said to Jeremiah, The Lord be a true and faithful witness between us, if we do not even according to all the things for which the Lord thy God shall send thee to us. Whether it be good, or whether it be evil, we will obey the voice of the Lord our God to whom we send thee, that it may be well with us when we obey the voice of the Lord our God. I believe the evil part it's talking about is, and I'm not trying to go in depth, um, you're going to do things for the Lord. This is a little side note. You're going to do things for the Lord, and sometimes bad things are going to happen to you because you're doing what the Lord wants you to. You're going to live according to the Lord, word of the Lord. You're going to do right knowing that bad things are going to happen to you. Right? You're going to get fired. Okay, someone comes to you and says, and you, the Holy Spirit in you says this person's sincere, they want to know about Jesus, you tell them about Jesus, a third person overhears and you get fired for it. You know if you preach Jesus at work, there's a chance you can get fired. A uh, family coming out saying, I'm a King James Bible believer, Bible believing, God fearing man or woman, repercussions with family, how the lost world's going to treat you, you know, all kinds of things. So good or evil, they're going to obey the voice of the Lord our God. And it came to pass after ten days that the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah. Then called he Jonah, Jonan, the son of Kar, Kuria, I heard of that, and all the captains of the forces which were with him, and all the people from the least even to the greatest, and said unto them, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, unto whom ye send me to present your supplication before him. If ye will still abide in this land, then will I build you and not put, pull you down, and I will plant you and not pluck you up. For I repent me of the evil that I have done unto you. We're going to go to 12. Be not afraid of the king of Babylon, of whom ye are afraid. Be not afraid of him, saith the Lord, for I am with you to save you and to deliver you from his hands. So they're already in his hands because God punished him. Now he's repenting of the evil, the punishment, and he's going to get him out. Verse 12. And I will show mercies unto you, that he may have mercy upon you. And cause you to return to your own land. Once again, a lot of times when we see repent, when it comes to the Lord, when we see it all through the book of Jeremiah, it has to do with mercy. God showing mercy. He could have gone all the way and continued punishing somebody. He got mad at Israel once he was going to utterly destroy them. But they repented and God repented. Now I understand that God wasn't going to destroy them utterly. He made a promise to Abraham. Um, but the point is, is it's all about mercy when God repents. Him showing mercy. Um, he stops the evil. It's also about um, His love for you, because chastisement is a good thing. Uh, you're to fear it before it happens. It's supposed to be a good motivator. It's the best motivator, should be, to do what's right. And when you fall into sin, and you can't, you just won't repent, 
God will chastise you, and afterwards it's a good thing. It shows love. So his repentance shows love, and it shows mercy. But once again, when God repents, it's him showing love and mercy. It's not saying he's a sinner. It's not saying, the Bible's not saying that God's a sinner because he repents. When we repent, it's because we're sinners, or we did something that causes us to regret the, what we did. Okay, a good example of that would be, I decide I'm going to put huge tires on my truck without doing the lift, and I start driving it, and it starts grinding and hurting the truck, so then I'm like, man, I repent, I put those tires on, and I put other tires on. Was it a sin? No. But the outcome was bad, and I had sorrow for what I did. You hurt your truck. So that's the book of Jeremiah. We're moving along. Um, repentance, not a work. Don't let people tell you otherwise that repentance is a work and you're trying to teach works-based salvation when true biblical repentance is part of salvation. It's an important part of salvation. Okay? It happens in here. Repentance happens in here. So when you have your belief, it makes it down to here. Belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And if you skip repentance, that belief is just up here. It doesn't make it down here without repentance. That belief will never leave your head and make it to your heart if you skip repentance. God had mercy. God looks at the heart. So that's the word study repent for Jeremiah. Grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you brothers and sisters in Christ and I will be praying for you. Continue to pray for me in this ministry that God has blessed me with being a part of. I'll see you in the next video.